I'm Trevor Young, Dean of the University of Toronto's Temerty Faculty of Medicine. In September, we announced a landmark $250 million gift from James and Louise Temerty and the Temerty Foundation. As the largest philanthropic gift in Canadian history, it still takes my breath away. Their donation is an investment in our shared vision of the future, one where we'll champion enhanced discovery and collaboration while also striving for excellence through equity in everything that we do. Throughout this series, we're going to tell you about some of our remarkable research and programs that will advance health and healthcare, both here in Canada and around the world. To help guide this conversation, we've got Andre Picard, our good friend and the award-winning health columnist for the Globe and Mail. Andre, thank you for making time for us and for all the great work that you do. Medicine Talk. Today we have three brilliant scientists from the University of Toronto's Temerty Faculty of Medicine who are serving on the research front lines of Canada's response to SARS-CoV-2 and to COVID-19. First is Professor Scott Gray-Owen from the Department of Molecular Genetics. Give us a wave, Scott. Uh, Scott is the director of the university's containment level three lab, only one of two in Toronto, where researchers are able to safely work with nasty bugs like HIV, tuberculosis, and more recently, SARS, of course. Uh, or I should call it SARS coronavirus two. Uh, he's also conducting his own research on the viral infectious cycle and how our immune systems respond during infection, as well as testing the effectiveness of PPE against this nasty virus. Welcome, Scott. Uh, next, I want to welcome Professor Karen Maxwell. Uh, give us a wave, Karen, so we know who you are there. Hi. Uh, from the Department of Biochemistry. Karen was part of the team who made the landmark discovery in 2017 of proteins called anti-CRISPRs, and they block bacterial cells' defenses. Today, her lab is developing a rapid saliva test for COVID-19 based on CRISPR-Cas technology. And we all want those rapid tests rapidly. Uh, she's also been a founding member of uh, the COVID-19 Resources Canada, which is a hub for sharing knowledge and supporting public health and research labs across Canada. Thanks for joining us today, Karen. And finally, we're delighted to have Professor Samara Mubareka uh, from the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology and also from Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. Uh, very early on in the pandemic, Samira and her colleagues were among the very first in Canada to isolate the virus, uh, an experience we'll hear a little bit about uh, later today. And not surprisingly, Samira's expertise in virology has been in high demand in recent months and she's been serving on the Chief Science Advisor of Canada's COVID-19 Expert Panel uh, with several other provincial and on several other provincial and national advisory panels. So welcome to you also, Samir. So we have a lot of questions that uh, we have a lot of people who've tuned in today and many of them have sent questions in advance. Uh, but I want to start with some some really basic stuff uh, bringing us back. And Samir, I thought I'd start with you. Uh, you're the virologist. You know this bug well. I want to get a sense of when did you know that SARS-CoV-2 was going to be a big deal? I think it really started at the end of December when we first heard about this um, outbreak. It was a small number of patients in, in China that um, had severe acute respiratory syndrome of unknown etiology. And ever since the first SARS coronavirus in, in the early 2000s, people have really been doing a lot of intensive surveillance for that kind of syndrome. Um, you know that when you start to see an uptick in an otherwise unexplained severe um, clinical syndrome like that, that there is potential that there's something new behind it. Um, I have to say that um, the Chinese officials and public health uh, agencies were incredibly forthcoming in terms of, you know, first of all, identifying the organism um, and then openly sharing all the data. So within a couple of weeks, really, maybe even less, we had whole genome sequences on this otherwise un undescribed virus, albeit it does resemble SARS coronavirus 1. Now, whether or not that may lead to a pandemic at that time, end of December, early January, was obviously very much in the air. We had no sense whether this was the tip of the iceberg and whether there was more widespread population um, uh, spread or infection. That was what we would call subclinical. And indeed, that was the case, we found out later. 
Um, but at that time, we really weren't sure. But I think very quickly over the course of January, it became apparent that this was a monumental event. Yeah, but there's a lot of these new things come up all the time. How, how did, why does one become a pandemic and all the others just kind of go away? So there are three conditions that have to be met for something to become a pandemic. Number one, it has to cause disease. That's somewhat self-evident. This one clearly does. Number two, it has to transmit efficiently from person to person. So before this pandemic, you may recall, we were all focused on highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses. And the difference between those avian influenza viruses and something like SARS-CoV-2 is that there's no sustained human-to-human -human transmission. So it causes severe disease um, and people get very, very sick, but it's usually from exposure to a certain reservoir. In the case of avian flu, it's poultry. Um, this very quickly spread human to human within, within the region um, where it initially was identified and then globally um, much more quickly. The third condition is that humans have to be susceptible. So if you have no pre-existing immunity, um, then the likelihood that something could become pandemic is, is uh, more evident. So that kind of explains why something like Zika virus, for example, was not a pandemic per se because it's transmitted primarily from one mosquito to a human. Um, and there's a little bit of human, human to human transmission by the sexual route, but it's not like a respiratory transmission. So that's why some viruses like Zika virus don't become pandemic per se, though you can certainly get large outbreaks like what we saw in Central and South America. Great. And we'll talk about some of this stuff a little later on too, we'll delve into it. Uh, Scott, I want to go over to you. Now you weren't a coronavirus researcher per se when this all began. So I'm interested, how does a scientist pivot really quickly into this? Uh, now it takes up all your time, I'm assuming. Yes, it does. So I think this is what has happened across Toronto and across the globe with researchers is there's been a very strong pivot towards this. One thing about infectious disease is that it, it involves so many different systems. And so um, it's not necessarily a pure virologist per se. Uh, but we need cell biologists, which sometimes are cancer researchers, and we need immunologists who might be studying uh, auto. I think so. Scott's uh, nice a bit, but, uh, we'll give him a second to catch his breath. Come back now. Yeah, Scott, you were freezing up on us a bit there for a second. Am I back now? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, and so from my own personal experience, uh, my group is interested in, in bacteria and viruses that, that interact with the host and on a molecular level and an immuno. I think we'll try and get to uh, Scott's I, sound. Uh, maybe can, yeah, you're breaking up on a stop. So I think we're going to try and get you fixed if we can. And I'm going to jump over to Karen for a second. Maybe turn off your video for a second and we'll see if we can get sound and I'll come back to you. Uh, Karen, I'll, you know, Scott was starting to talk about this. He had a little bit of video problems. And he's talking about there's a lot of cooperation and a lot of interdisciplinary work, uh, almost, a, I'd say, un, in an unprecedented way in the response to, to this virus. Can you tell me a little bit about how important that's been, this working across different uh, specialties? Yeah, I think it's been critical in trying to really quickly come up with solutions to both for testing and, and as well as the sort of epidemiological studies that are looking at how this virus is transmitted and, and how we can treat the virus. And certainly, as Scott said, at the University of Toronto, groups very quickly got together and people from engineering and public health and the basic sciences have really all been working together in an unprecedented way, bringing different areas of expertise together in order to answer some of the big questions, develop new treatments, and again, particularly I think in diagnostics, there's really been a bringing together of of clinicians and engineers and basic biologists. I, I sense a lot of people have put their egos aside for this one. Is, am I wrong in thinking that? No, I think that's right. And certainly very early on in the pandemic, I think, I think part of the reason for it is we all felt so helpless. The university was shut down. We were all sitting at home. We're, we're trained scientists, we're analytical, we, we know that we have skills that can 
be applied to this situation and that could that could help and uh, um, you know U of T organized early on we had meetings twice a day from faculty across all of, uh, of many different uh, areas of research and we were we were meeting at 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. discussing how what can we do what can every one of us contribute in order to try and beat this pandemic Wow, and I know these conversations were going on around the world. Now we're going to hope we get Scott back. We're trying to work on him, uh, getting him live again. But I'll jump into, uh, oh, Scott, you're back again. Uh, if you unmute, we'll see if we can hear you. I, and I, I was asking you earlier about how you pivoted to, to this uh, new coronavirus. And maybe I should ask you how we are all adapting to life on Zoom too, but uh, save that for another day. So tell us a bit about how you got into this uh, new field for you. Yeah, sorry about the news. Um, yeah, and so I've been director of the CL3, the containment level three lab, which is where high risk uh, pathogens have to be studied. This is a, a building within the building uh, that keeps hand, keeps security um, for the pathogen and, and, and safety for the investigators who are using it. And I've directed this lab for about 12 years now. And so this is mean, meant being involved with a wide variety of pathogens, uh, bacteria such as the, that, that cause. And so uh, what we have at hand really is, is a, a community of investigators who have really diverse backgrounds and diverse expertise. And so I've kind of had the great opportunity to be at, at the core of this and, and help bring people together uh, so that they can be involved and contribute to the response to this pandemic. Uh, great, and that comes to what Karen was talking about, about the cooperation. So I want to, uh, yeah. we got a lot of questions. I mentioned before, we got a lot of questions in advance, and a lot of them are about vaccines. So uh, maybe I'll go right to you, Samira, the virologist. People want to know how important is this news we're hearing from Pfizer and Moderna? Is, is this the end, or uh, how excited should we be, or how cautious should we be about this news? You know, I would view it as hopefully, hopefully, the beginning of the end. Um, I try to be optimistic about these things. There's, I don't think I need to repeat how unprecedented this is. Um, having said that, we do have experience with a very wide range of vaccines, particularly against viral pathogens. Um, having said that, we don't have experience with coronavirus vaccines in, in humans. So that, in that regard, it will be a first. And what we don't know is where will it fall on the spectrum? Is it going to be more like influenza where there are annual, vaccin annual vaccination that's required? We don't think it'll, if that's the case, we don't think it'll be for the same reason because the virus does not seem to be drifting as much as something like uh, influenza would drift. Or is it going to be more like measles where, you know, you get a vaccine in childhood or, or let's say a series of vaccines in childhood and, and you're generally set for life? Um, that, that is the question, but I have to say, these are phase three trials. It's as promising as it gets for this stage of research. So, so I prefer to keep my glass half full and there's a long road. There's a long road with respect to biomanufacturing and distribution and a number of things, but we're on the road. At least we can say that much. Oh, a couple of key things. We don't know how long the immunity will last, and we, we don't know either if it'll prevent people from transmitting, right? We know it'll prevent you from being infected, but we don't know that other part of the puzzle. That's correct. So we don't know if the immunity is sterilizing, so if you would stop shedding or does it reduce shedding, so is there any chance that it will still transmit, and how much disease does it prevent? So, you know, we, we have other vaccines that don't prevent infection, but they prevent hospitalization and death. Um, so they really are impactful in that regard. Though someone might still get a mild, milder form of, of disease. We're not even entirely sure how long immunity lasts with natural infection because we're maybe 11 months into it. We're starting to see some reports of reinfection. Um, so we're keeping a very close eye. It's a very important to follow what we call early cohorts. So, so people who were infected back in uh, February and March um, to see whether or not they develop secondary infection or whether they have uh, you know, memory B cells or, or, or more long-lasting immunity. That'll be very helpful. And Karen, these are messenger RNA vaccines. I don't know if you can help us 
Can you help us understand that technology? We hear it's new, but it sounds very fancy. Can you help explain it simply to, to us uh, lay people? Yeah, so with this, uh, this type of vaccine, again, it is new. This would be the first one that's licensed for use in people. Uh, so it, it's similar to other vaccines. They inject the RNA into the muscle cell and that your, your cells take it up and they produce the proteins. And so it's, what it's doing is it's causing your body to make uh, copies of what is normally present on the outer surface of the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And, you know, there are, while those are the, the mRNA vaccines are the ones that are farthest along, there are other vaccines in development that are uh, more similar to our traditional vaccines, attenuated viruses or uh, antigens presented from those viruses. But vaccines sort of trick the immune system into thinking there's an infection, so they, they act, right? Mm -hmm. And this is just another method of doing that, is that right? Yes, it's just another method of doing it. So it's, it's a way that we can present the body with a part of the virus particle that it would normally see, and that triggers the immune system to start mounting uh, an immune response against it. And so then when you, act, you know, if you become infected and your body actually sees the real virus, that it can recognize that and very quickly start to mount immunity and shut down the infection rapidly. And Scott, I would want to welcome you back. Uh, in your lab, you have these ultra cold freezers and we keep hearing these Pfizer has to, vaccine has to be kept at minus 74 degrees. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, people are wondering why does it have to be so cold and two, is somebody going to steal your fridges? Uh, I think you're muted now. <laughs> We're having challenges with sound and vision. Uh, I still have you on mute there. I thought scientists would have no problem with Zoom. It makes me feel better as a layperson. No, no, we still can't hear you. But maybe, maybe Samira, you can help us a bit understand why, why does this stuff have to be so cold? And then we'll go back and see if they're stealing Scott's fridges. Um, so this isn't the first time that something has to be, a vaccine has to be kept at such low temperatures. It was a very similar story for the Ebola vaccine, uh, which they did manage to roll out, uh, mind you, in a much more limited you know, time and, and, and geographic area. But really, it's to keep the components stable, um, ultimately. If you, and, and there are other vaccines that we use that require a cold chain. It's just usually not that cold. Um, any live attenuated vaccines do need to be kept generally at about four degrees or refrigerator temperature. Again, just so that the components don't degrade. Um, so really, it's, a, it's a, the technical complexity of the actual vaccine or preparation itself that requires this. But the Moderna vaccine can be kept sort of at that fridge temperature. Yeah, so that seems to be a nice alternative, right? Um, that uh, it sounds like they're able to, to mitigate that potential challenge or, or circumvent that potential challenge. Right. We'll see if we can get Scott to jump in again. Uh, we still have you on mute on my screen, but... Uh, How's that? Much better. Okay, they got me off and back on, so I apologize. I think someone's toying with me here. <laughs> yeah, so I was wondering, you know, you have these this special lab, you have a, these fridges. Mm -hmm. uh, are somebody going to steal them? Uh, are we going to be able to have these in enough places around the country to do to vaccinate everyone? Yeah, this is a really interesting challenge. There's never been an RNA uh, vaccine produced before, as Karen mentioned, and so uh, the the ultra cold chain that's required to keep some of these vaccines and not all of them. And, and in fact, the difference between uh, the two that are maybe at the forefront right now, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, is, is a big difference. In that one has to be at minus 80, whereas one could be at minus 20. And uh, as I started to say before, the, the, the challenge is twofold. One is that the RNA itself is, is inherently not stable. Uh, our cells degrade it very quickly. Enzymes in the environment degrade it very quickly. And so uh, this, this is one of the reasons it has to be kept so cold. The other is that this lipid uh, vesicle that holds it and that, that has two functions. It's, it protects it until it can get into our cells. 
Um, and then it, it encodes and delivers the RNA into, the, into our cell's cytoplasm. And so this has to be maintained as confirmation. And it, it's a very important part of this vaccine that isn't, hasn't been part of vaccines in the past. And so those two things are, are certainly a challenge. And they're, they're a different challenge in a, in a country like Canada than they might be in a, in a, company, in a country that wouldn't have a cold chain to rural villages, for example. But you still say it would be difficult for your average pharmacist or doctor to do this. Uh, they don't all have this equipment. Yeah, even even these freezers, uh, there's something that are common in our research labs, but there's only been a certain market for them up until this point. And, and now you can imagine if really we need billions of doses of this vaccine, it's just uh, not feasible to think that there can be enough freezers uh, manufactured in time and delivered across the globe uh, to, to hold these. And so I, I think what will happen is early vaccines can be done this way. Other ways to stabilize them in, in subsequent formulations, they might be able to stabilize them differently so that they don't have to be kept in this cold chain. Or some of the other vaccines are more traditional vaccines and they, these take longer to develop. So they're not the ones we're hearing about in the media right now. But cold chain is less a problem with those vaccines. And so that might roll out and, and allow them to be spread out around the planet much more quickly. And Karen, on that point, you mentioned earlier, you know, there are other vaccines coming. How, how important is that? Is it, why don't we just settle for these two and move on? Do we need other ones and why? Well, I, you know, I think it's important to keep developing, keep working on development of vaccines. Certainly with these ones, it's, it's very early days. And again, as Samira mentioned earlier, we don't know how long lasting the immunity may be. Some of the vaccines may elicit a type of immunity that lasts longer. Uh, as Scott mentioned, supply chain issues will be a problem. And, and this vaccine, having if we have to keep it at minus 80 or minus 20, it, it may not be deliverable to large numbers of people globally. And so I think coming up with these additional vaccines that may uh, stimulate the immune system in a different way, that may provide better, longer lasting immunity, uh, could be an important feature of some of these other vaccines. Now I've seen in the, the media reports that these vaccines, these early ones, they're, they're expensive, uh, they need two shots. Do you think we'll get sort of the, what we nearly really need, a cheap one shot vaccine that works? Uh, is that doable? I think anything's potentially doable. Um, you know, as Samira mentioned again earlier, uh, we don't, we've never had a coronavirus vaccine before that's, that has worked. And uh, so I think at this point, it's, it's sort of hard to predict, but, but a lot of people are working really hard. We have, we have incredibly brilliant people working on this problem. So I, I feel confident that, that there will be something at some point. Now, Samira, we also have a bunch of questions. People are talking about, they're confused about, is this coronavirus, is it airborne, is it aerosol, is it both? People are kind of confused about how it spreads in the air. Can you help us understand that, that aspect? And I think I made her disappear with that question. She didn't like it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's Scott or, how are you on airborne stuff? I know that's not your specialty, but uh, I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, so this is... Back. This is Samira's specialty for sure. Yeah. Uh, she's one of the world leaders in this regard. I, I think what's important is, is practically speaking and, and thinking about the definition of, of airborne and aerosolization, I think practically speaking, it, it really depends on, on where it's going to deliver, how it's going to transmit, and where it will deliver it into our lungs. And so there's really fundamental questions that we don't know yet is to the point of why do people respond differently once they're infected. Some people have a devastating disease and other people have a milder infection. And so practically speaking, I, I think we can only do so much in a short period of time. Our buildings weren't built to, to contain air in individual compartments, right? Individual rooms or apartments next to each other or others. Um, the masking is, is clearly helping both from exhaling and inhaling, they don't protect us completely. But, and how much the large or smaller particles are delivered into the, the top part of our lung or the lower part of our lung might, might have a really direct effects on what type of disease or how severe the disease happens from that. And so I, I think there's 
in some respects an academic um, discussion about this and I think it's, it's an incredibly important point but practically speaking for us to contain the spread in a very short period of time this has come upon us very very quickly um, where we cannot uh, repackage build or rework buildings and HVAC systems and buildings and things like that I think it's it's uh, understanding what the transmission is and, and how the delivery of these whatever the smaller or larger particles into our lung is the important part. Yeah, I think you make an important point that we don't have to get into the minutiae of this in the public. Uh, mm -hmm. Wear a mask, uh, wash your hands, and don't worry about the too many of the details. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And Karen, uh, hopefully we'll get Samira back and we'll ask her more uh, aerosol questions. Uh, Karen, I want to ask you about, you know, the profile of scientists has really increased a lot uh, during this pandemic. Uh, wondering how how do you keep that up? How do you ensure that uh, public policies that scientists keep being listened to? That that's a great question, um, and you know I think I think it's something that uh, as scientists that we will have to work on. I think often we get very caught up in our own small areas of research, and and I think this pandemic has really shown us how important it is to have. Uh, a lot of public discourse and to be speaking with with both people in the public but as well as politicians to talk about how important science research is and I think the pandemic again has really driven home how important science is and how important biomedical research is um, and you know hopefully now that these avenues have opened and there is there's a lot of discourse going on among uh, academic scientists and and clinicians and the government, and hopefully that will maintain this moving forward. And talk about the, the, the labs in particular, your specialty is, uh, is labs and they've really come to the forefront for in good and bad news stories. Uh, how do you keep that profile up? Because that's an area that I'd say was just totally taken for granted uh, before. How, how do you keep up your profile and importance? Well, uh, you know, I think, Personally, I do try and uh, have, I, I attend quite a number of public outreach events. I mean, my, my one area of research in my lab is CRISPR-Cas and, you know, there's certainly, I'm invited to quite a few public outreach events, debates on, on the technology. And again, I think as scientists, we really need to be cognizant of, of taking our message to people and, and telling people why it's important. We get used to speaking to each other and speaking in a manner that, that the average person doesn't understand. And I, I, think it's, I think it's critical for us to explain to people why biomedical research is important. So people will want the government to put money into it and to fund research so we can have advances. And again, you know, a, these, these vaccines, these mRNA vaccines appear to have happened very quickly, but they've been, those types of vaccines have been in the works for quite a while. There were, there were years of work put into them before SARS-CoV-2 hit. And because of that prior knowledge and the base that they built, they were really able to quickly pivot and, and develop the vaccine for COVID-19. And Scott, I wondered if you could address that a bit. I know you're passionate about this, about the need for science-informed uh, or science-based yeah. public policy. Uh, has the pandemic helped with that uh, that push? Yeah, I think uh, just following up on the point from Karen, I think it is important to to recognize that this vaccine we will have probably in the span of a year. But this vaccine, that the technology and the knowledge that we needed to build this vaccine didn't happen in a year. It happened in decades. And it, it's really a tale, I guess, two really uh, easy ways to grasp this is, is if we would have spent more time following up on SARS-1, the original SARS infection, we would be much better prepared right now to uh, deal with this one. It's a different virus, but it's a related virus. Uh, and beyond the virus itself, uh, we would have vaccines that maybe would have targeted the first ones. We would have therapies that would have been able to deal with the, the clinical manifestations, the, the disease itself. And so um, we can't lose sight of these things very quickly. We have to follow up on them. And, and the other important note is, is that government agencies often think that they're going to streamline research and focuses on translational work where there has to be an end goal. But, but the end goal here was in no one's mind before. And 
the lessons learned were really from basic science that's happened over the span of decades. And so one of the coronaviruses that was studied most deeply in the past had nothing to do with humans at all. It was murine hepatitis virus. And this is a virus that causes liver disease in mice. And so it would be very easy to say, who cares? Uh, why are we spending any time studying this? And yet this gave us the knowledge of, of what this spike protein is and how does it work and how do we target it? And so all of this, the, the development, the understanding of the coronavirus, the development of these new RNA-based vaccines, which up until a year ago were really almost theoretical as far as whether they would work or not for an infectious disease, has happened over the span of decades and really put us in a place where we are now without any ability to look that direction for it. We weren't aiming for a, a therapy. We weren't aiming for a drug. We weren't aiming for a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. It was just different people trying to understand important biological systems that have come together and given us this answer. Okay. That's an era. Welcome back. Uh, uh, we were, Scott uh, filled in and answered, I think, the aerosol uh, question earlier. So I want to bring you on this discussion about, we're talking about, you know, the profile of scientists has gone up tremendously. Uh, how can we continue that they influence public policy so it's uh, science informed and evidence based? Uh, how do we keep up that momentum? Keep the momentum is essential. You know, infectious diseases research in general has always been, generally speaking, um, feast or famine. So there are, you know, catalyst funds that appear if there's a pandemic or an emerging virus or, you know, a little bit too late into the game, we realized the importance of antimicrobial resistance, for example. So these are all things that now, you know, Lyme disease, things that are topical that now are being funded, but we're really lacking in a strong foundational sort of program development um, uh, type of funding that's been there for, I think, other diseases that are a little bit more long-term or, or chronic or just that are, that are higher on people's priority lists. Um, and, you know, we tend to get bumped up uh, during events like these and then sort of forgotten in between. I have to say, though, I feel that policymakers right now are more receptive than they've ever been. Um, I just hope we've been, we still continue to be very reactive with how we pursue um, different avenues of research, um, what gets supported for different avenues of research. And that's understandable because we're in the midst of a massive pandemic. I mean, this virus has brought the world to its knees. But at this stage, I don't think it's clear to me in two years or five years, where we'll be from a foundational perspective. So I'm talking about foundational knowledge, like, like Scott spoke about basic science. Have we really built more um, as a result of this? Will we be any further ahead at that time when perhaps an avian influenza virus or another coronavirus spills over, because it will happen. Um, I think we need to start looking, it's obvious that the pandemic's with us for a while. So we need to start having a longer longer range vision at this stage. Flesh that out a bit. Uh, there, we know there's gonna be other pandemics. So how do we prepare for them uh, without being reactive, without waiting till they're a huge global disaster? What, what the labs need? Need so they can prepare for this? Well, there are three stages that really uh, happen when pandemics cut. I know I, I talked about the three determinants for pandemics. I sound very structured. I'm usually not, not so much. But um, really, we talk about pre-emergence. Um, so if you think about all these viruses, a lot of antimicrobial resistant bacteria as well, they all are of zoonotic origin. Um, so that, in other words, they have animal reservoirs or, or, or some kind of reservoir in the environment. And we haven't really done our due diligence in terms of understanding those reservoirs. So that's number one. We're a little bit better when we think about agricultural animals because they're a commodity and they're also a lot easier to do surveillance in and sample them with livestock. Wildlife is a different story. Um, there's definitely room for improvement there. And it's not just about um, you know, testing a population of animals, identifying virus X, and then you know, publishing about it. It's really about understanding the determinants of spillover. And the determinants of spillover are a unknown for the most part, with the exception of a few things. And we know that uh, just sheer abundance of a particular animal um, and also diversity within the animal population itself uh, 
can lead to potential spillover. But probably the most important uh, determinant is human behavior and human encroachment into those habitats. So understanding pre-emergence is really key to pandemic preparedness. And then the next step is really understanding and um, mitigating against local spread. Because if you can stop things at the local level, so having really strong surveillance systems, like for example, um, surveillance for acute respiratory illness, or let's say uh, otherwise unexplained cases of meningitis or, or encephalitis, these kind of syndromic surveillance uh, programs are really important and have potential to potentially keep things from going from an outbreak state to a pandemic state. So it's all about virology, microbiology at the fundamental level, but it has to be tied into ecology, epidemiology, and public health. None of those things in isolation is going to answer the question. And we have to make those investments in science if we're going to get the benefits. Correct. Now, Karen, I want to come back again to a communication question because there's a lot of them. Uh, somebody's asking, do scientists have an obligation to tackle misinformation? Now, there's misinformation in your area. There's a lot more in coronavirus area. Do you have that obligation or do you, can you just sit back and be angry? Yeah, I think, you know, there has been a lot of discussion about this. And I think even within the scientific community, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, should scientists sit with one area of expertise keep in their lane? Should all scientists be trying to speak out about coronavirus misinformation, even if it's not quite their area of expertise? And I, I think the answer is yes. I think that there is so much misinformation out there um, that, that it's really, it's our duty to, to be trying to battle this. And, you know, as uh, one part of this, this COVID-19 Resources Canada that I'm involved with, one area that we're really focusing on is community outreach, education, and battling misinformation. And I, you know, I think it comes back to getting public support for public health measures. If there's misinformation out there that's saying, oh, you don't need to wear a mask, we, we need to be educating the public why the recommendations that the government is making are important. And, you know, I think I think it's critical that, that we be speaking out. Now, Scott, uh, we're almost, uh, we're running out of time there, but we have time for a couple more questions. But one, an interesting one is people are asking, what's the one question you want answered about COVID-19? You're a scientist, you work with this every day. What's the thing you really want to know? Yeah, that's a tough question. One, to narrow it to one. I think fundamentally to me, uh, what's important, most important at this stage is, is something I touched on earlier. Why do people respond so differently to this virus, right? So say, this could be genetic differences between us. It could be prior exposure to other bacteria or other viruses, including the, the cold-like coronaviruses that we all catch every year probably and get stimply noses and they don't otherwise bother us. It, it could be where it's delivered into our lung or if you if you inhale it deep or into your lung versus it staying up in your nose. Or it could be just the amount of virus that we're exposed to, maybe that, that's it as well. And, and also there's all these, there's a lot of different uh, health issues that might lie below this and might affect the way we deal with this. And I think this is important because it, it not just to understand the disease itself, but it will help us prioritize our efforts as far as who to treat, who to spend more time on, what treatments, people with different manifestations or different likely outcomes might respond to better. But it also will inform us for vaccines, what type of immune response that, that we, want to, we want to develop with them. The vaccine does two things. One is it's a big wanted sign to, to let us uh, tell the immune system what the virus looks like. But the, the other part of this, the adjuvant that is attached to that, uh, helps us guide the immune system so that there's a particular kind of response. And it's pretty clear that certain types of responses, immune responses, are going to be protective, whereas other ones actually might uh, uh, increase disease or, or, or make a work more difficult outcome for that individual. And so I think understanding these differences, which will happen because we're at a population levels of infection, and we can see how pe different types of people respond once we get uh, their genome sequenced and once we look at their immune responses, I think will be really, really uh, informative for this pandemic, but also for future epidemics or pandemics or, or 
infections that diseases that arise. And Samira, as someone who works with these nasty bugs, uh, what's the question you want answered about uh, COVID-19? This for me, it's um, kind of long-standing fascination with these little molecular machines. I mean, they're, they're beautiful and terrifying at the same time. And one thing that really struck me was how the three different high consequence coronaviruses, so the first SARS, MERS, and SARS coronavirus 2 are similar and yet profoundly different in how, the, how efficiently they transmit. Because MERS and the first SARS did not transmit nearly as efficiently as, as this virus. And, and the difference in mortality. So I guess that comes back a little bit to what, what Scott was saying, but more from the viral perspective. So MERS has a very high mortality rate. Um, SARS coronavirus 1, less so, and this one the least, though it's still highly impactful just because of the sheer number of people that been infected. And SARS-1 and SARS-2 have a lot of areas in their genome that are very similar. So the differences must be where they differ genomically and figuring out exactly what those are would be very helpful for the sake of, of discovery and knowledge, but also in future for the sake of surveillance. So there are some parts of the genome, for example, the, there's something called a polybasic cleavage site in the S protein that we know is conferring increased virulence. So now if we do surveillance in animals for coronaviruses, we should look for that polybasic cleavage site. I think the more of those types of knowledge that we gain um, will be very, very helpful. So that would be my one thing is why, why this virus is so effective at transmitting and, and, and causing disease. When you were talking, I was thinking it's like my children. Why do they both come from the same source, but they're so very different? Uh, I guess same as coronaviruses. Uh, Karen, uh, what do you want to know? What's your big unanswered question now? So, I, you know, I, Samira saying molecular machines really hit home for me. So I, my training actually is structural biology and I study viruses, but viruses that infect bacteria. And I'm really interested in how those viruses assemble and how they hijack the host cell to take over the host cell. And so really, the, the questions that I really want answered are, are sort of the more fundamental questions about how does the virus take over the cell and, and how does it reproduce copies of itself. And with a couple of minutes left, I always like to end panels on a hopeful note. So I want you each to tell me, you know, we, we're getting lots of bad news this week. The numbers are awful. There's a lot of bad news, but I want to know what gives you uh, hope looking forward at, at this uh, pandemic. Uh, for it to end or whatever. What, what leaves you hopeful? Karen, I'll, I'll go in reverse order. I'll start with you. You know, I would say uh, there are a couple of things that, that make me feel hopeful and, and they're related to the pandemic. Um, I would say the way in Canada, certainly the way people have pulled together and how, how everybody's obeying the rules. And I think we're seeing the, and, and helping each other. I think we're seeing the best in humanity come out. Um, and I would say, again, from a scientific point of view, how scientists have all pulled together and how everyone is cooperating to try and overcome this. And you guys are a great uh, shining example of that at U of T, so that's great. Scott, uh, what gives you hope going forward? Yeah, I guess the thing that gives me hope, it, it, the new vaccine data for the clinical trials are, are very reassuring. I think when this first came down as a uh, as that this might spread around the world I, I think on on a textbook level on a, on a fundamental understanding uh, based on built on the work that was done with MERS previously and done with this murine uh, hepatitis virus and others we expected that the spike was going to be something that that we needed to target and and in that this respect we're quite fortunate that this pandemic is a coronavirus. It's 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 funny to say, but uh, we understand this class of viruses and what a vaccine should look like. And uh, we're fortunate now. It's it's very reassuring that the vaccines, based on this knowledge, look like they're going to be successful, at least uh, helping us control the effect. And the reason I say that it's, we're fortunate that it's a coronavirus is there's other viruses like HIV that we've studied intensively for 40 years, and we could not come up with nobody could come up with a vaccine for that in a year. We wouldn't even know what it looked like. We wouldn't begin to know what it looked like. And there's been many vaccine studies that really there's, there's no success uh, after years of work if they don't like look like the vaccine helps at all. So 
I, I'm really hopeful that the fact that that science has pivoted, that this this fundamental knowledge, this basic research, has come to the front and given us an answer to deal with this 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 awful um, devastation that we're seeing right now. And Samira, the last word. You know as much about this virus as anyone in the world. What what gives you some hope? I think to me the the main. Um, most hopeful aspect of what's come so far is how receptive, I know I said this before, but you know, how receptive policymakers have really been to, to scientists and, and, and scientific findings and data. And behind all of that data is uh, an immense army of incredibly talented postdocs, PhD students, master's students. That is actually what keeps me coming in every day and gives me hope is just seeing, I mean, behind each one of us here and any scientist, there's, there's a whole crew of people who are working night and day on this. Um, I think that, that that gives me hope for the future. Well, that's a great great note to end on. Uh, uh, so Samira Mubaraka, Scott Gray Owen, Karen Maxwell, thank you very much for joining us, sharing your insight. Uh, I'm sure we could talk for a couple of hours more, but uh, people have to get back to their, their day jobs and other Zoom calls and such. And I want to th thank those audience members who took time to, to join us today to submit the questions. I got to a lot of them. I didn't get to all of them, unfortunately, but uh, we'll try and do it in future events. Uh, like our first Timberly Medicine talk on AI, uh, uh, you know, today's event has been recorded and it will be shared with everyone. Uh, anyone who's registered via email will get a link to watch this again. And uh, appreciate the richness of the conversation the second time around even more, I think. And both these uh, recordings will be found on the Temerty Medicine website. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we have uh, planned a wonderful finale in our three-part uh, Temerty Talk series. On December 14th, I'll be back, and I'll be hosting a discussion on the role of physician training in the pursuit of health equity. Very hot topic, an important topic, one you won't want to miss. So uh, circle December 14th in your calendars. And until then, again, thank you for joining us, and thank you to our panelists, and uh, until next time. Stay, stay well.